It's been a blistering few weeks of macro event risk, and this week, things slow down. So what is going to give the markets that next directional push? That's what we're going to try and figure out here. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. And what we're going to do is try to unpick First of all, how we got to the wild price action that we saw last week. Uh, and then, of course, see if there is perhaps a new regime in the works and make the argument that the earnings report from NVIDIA, needless to say, a focal point for equity investors, is now not just that, but also a macro indicator in its own right. Try to unpick that as we go. And uh, we'll begin with a conversation about how markets performed last week. Uh, we can see here the S&P 500 taking a meaningful leg lower, 2.1%. NASDAQ uh, seeing an even larger decline, 3.5%. Much of that coming as we suspected here on Macro Money, uh, in the wake of the comments that we heard from Fed Chair Jerome Powell last week. Now, you might say, well, why would this be something uh, that should be uh, market moving? Uh, we had Jerome Powell speak after the Fed press conference just less than a week before those uh, comments uh, that he uh, delivered in Texas last week. So what was he going to say that was different? And as ever, the answer is, well, it's not about what he says. It's about whether the markets choose to hear him. And that's, of course, exactly uh, the difference that we ended up having. Uh, when we had the Fed chair speaking after the FOMC policy announcement, which was, of course, immediately in the wake of the resounding election that we had at the beginning of this month in the United States. The markets seemingly heard him, seemingly moved in a direction that suggested perhaps higher interest rates are ahead, perhaps the Fed is not as prepared to really make the uh, dovish commitments a reality that they made in September. Those are, of course, not hard commitments. They're uh, more like loose forecasts. But nevertheless, the markets do take that as guidance. And needless to say, everything we've seen in markets uh, in September and thereafter, especially after that Fed policy announcement, has been pointed at the reflation story, where the market looked at the economy, looked at the Fed saying they're cutting by 50 basis points, would give another 50 basis points before year end and another 100 basis points in 2025, and said, oh, you are going to be cutting interest rates into an economy that isn't cool. Okay, so that will just make it even hotter. That will mean inflation. That will mean you can't actually deliver on all those rate cuts. So when the Fed, after the FOMC policy announcement, asserted as much, albeit with a little bit uh, less obvious uh, kind of rhetoric, it didn't really seem to phase stock markets, but it did help the dollar keep, go, uh, keep going higher. Uh, it did help uh, with yields uh, continuing to stay elevated. It certainly seemed to reflect negatively in gold, as one might expect. Last week, the Fed chair delivered very much those same sentiments. Perhaps he delivered them a little bit more forcefully. And perhaps this time we were out of the immediate blast radius of the election. So this time stocks felt like they could respond. We, so we got, in the wake of those comments, a sharp sell-off in stocks. Most of those losses were sustained on Friday. Uh, yields continued to move higher. We have gains across the curve. But as we can see here, less movement at the front end. Perhaps the market thinks the Fed is more ready to uh, follow through in December, so much as it's kind of talked its way into that 
uh, and instead use the opportunity to dilute the outlook for the subsequent year. December, of course, is going to give us another update of the Fed's official forecasting. So perhaps they'll give us the December cut. They'll do the 100 basis points for 2024, of which 75 are already on the books. And then maybe for next year, the situation looks less aggressive. As it stands, uh, that December uh, rate cut has a uh, likelihood of 58.4%, looking at what's baked into Fed funds futures, which is a meaningful downstep from Friday even, where it was 62%, and a far cry from where it was a month ago, closer to 80 So looking at the situation uh, here, seems like uh, the steepening of the curve where the 10-year, uh, and in general the long end, sees a bigger uh, uplift in rates than does the front end. That seems to make sense in that context, where maybe there's not that much that the Fed is going to do differently at the next meeting, but the signaling certainly uh, portends less scope for stimulus after the turn of the calendar year. Crude oil continues to do its own thing. It has uh, a um, ugly near 5% decline last week, but ultimately holds within familiar ranges and doesn't go very far. Of course, today with um, seemingly another uptick on the geopolitics front, we get it a little bit higher. So not much uh, to look at from the macro narrative perspective in crude oil. It doesn't seem to be uh, lining up with a lot of the uh, bigger moves. Gold, on the other hand, much more clear cut. And against the backdrop of higher yields, and then, of course, the stronger U.S. dollar that those higher yields then bring, gold behaves as you might expect and loses nearly 5%. That dollar strength evident in uh, the greenback's performance against the euro, that's down 1.7% last week. The yen also down 1.1%. Although on Friday, against the backdrop of that risk aversion, the yen actually finds its way higher, so suggesting it's once again finding a way to benefit even when yields move against it uh, from the liquidation of carry trades that are effectively short yen positions. Uh, when that is unwound amid risk aversion, you typically get yen strength almost mechanically, and that's sort of what we got on Friday. Otherwise, that loss in the yen would have looked much bigger. Bitcoin continues to surge, 18.9% gain last week. Uh, that still seems to be the uh, echo of the Trump administration's resounding win in the elections uh, and uh, following on from news that we now have congressional majorities for Republicans in both houses. Uh, the Trump administration very much ran on a crypto-friendly platform and this is perhaps still working its way through the space. With that in mind, we have a far less U.S.-centric calendar this week. In fact, we don't really get to meaty U.S. economic data until we get toward the latter part of the week. So what we'll do here is first talk about those things that are on the menu outside of the U.S., and then focus in on NVIDIA, which is, of course, uh, the big strange one, as far as macro risk, at least, this week. So the first thing is a batch of inflation data, and uh, we're going to get it from three different economies. The first one is Canada, where we're expecting to see headline inflation tick up a little bit, 1.9% uh, on the headline number. Uh, the core not seen changed meaningfully here, uh, and uh, that's perhaps something uh, that the Bank of Canada can hope to take to the bank. But nevertheless, the uptick is an interesting sort of um, headwind in the sense that we still, when we look at uh, the expectations for what comes next here uh, for uh, 
the Bank of Canada are expecting another cut. Looking here, the current rate in Canada, 3.75%, and futures imply 3.42. So uh, consider that another sort of uh, cut, standard sized, of course, uh, down to three and a half. Uh, and then from there, another uh, eight basis points being baked in toward a uh, jumbo-sized 50 basis point cut at the last meeting of the year. Probability of that outcome, 32%, so not great. Uh, but the likelihood of at least one more cut fully priced in. Now, if we were to get something in line with how uh, Canadian data has been performing recently, it has tended to underperform relative to forecasts. We can see that here. Not only is this index, the City Economic Surprise Index for Canada, below zero, but it's actually moving deeper into that negative territory, suggesting that data outcomes are not only tending to miss forecasts, but the margin of disappointment is expanding. And if that's the case on the CPI data, then this is going to look more logical. And with that, you probably get some reinforcement that as the ball moves to a less dovish setting for the Fed, you have a greater yield disadvantage for the, the Canadian dollar, and we resume its losses against its U.S. counterpart. The cut is already baked in here, so there's not a terrible amount of room for a, a repricing and a rethink. It's a little bit different when we get to what's going on in the UK, which is the other uh, area where we're going to get inflation data. Uh, the core rate here seen holding unchanged at 3.2%, much like in Canada, where it's being seen unchanged at one6 in the headline, though, again, as with Canada, the expectation is for an uptick, 2.2% uh, on UK inflation. Uh, that's after a, a dip below 2% in the previous report. Uh, the core rate for September was one7 Here also, we are looking at data that has tended to increasingly underperform relative to expectations. This is that surprise index. It is below zero, and it is pushing deeper that way, which, again, as with the GDP numbers last week, sets the stage for a disappointment and may start to shift the thinking on whether another rate cut is possible before year end. Now, if we look at what the markets are pricing in here for the BOE, it's a mere six basis points toward a cut left for the remainder of this year and 60 basis points for next year. It seems like a very significant stretch to look at this and say, oh, we're going to go from six basis points to 25 and bake in another cut at the December meeting unless the CPI data misses by a very significant margin. So the bar is relatively high. But even if we move to 13 basis points and it became a 50-50 shot, the British pound seems unlikely to respond well. So that would be something to watch. Likewise, uh, the markets stocks-wise, uh, the ETF there is EWU, uh, you might see a little bit of a recovery that uh, index has been moving lower a little bit recently, but if it looked like a rate cut was more possible in December than currently, at this point it's not even being considered very seriously at six basis points, uh, then perhaps you could get a little bit of a lift there. The larger issue will be what happens with the outlook for 2025, where we have 60 basis points now. If that became meaningfully higher, if that started to drift toward fully baking in 75, that is three cuts rather than 50, which is two, we're a little bit over that now. If we started to get closer to 75, that seems like it would be a much more potent headwind uh, for 
the pound and may give uh, local stocks a little bit more of a lift. But we'll see, of course, how that uh, develops. Because the next place we go is Japan, where the story is actually the opposite from what we saw in both Canada and in the UK. Here, inflation is expected to come down for a second consecutive month. The peak was 3% in August. In September, we came, uh, came down to 2.5. The expectation is this time we're going to come down to 2.2% year on year. And perhaps that could help with this sense that uh, the Bank of Japan is not going to be in a hurry to keep hiking. Then again, that much is also pretty well priced into the markets. These are uh, overnight index swaps that essentially reflect uh, policy expectations. And we can see that the, really the next instance where we see any kind of significant moves is at least three months out. So if you consider that the Bank of Japan moves in 10 basis point increments, we can see that currently we're at a quarter of a percent. We're looking at another 10 basis points in three months, then another in six months, then another in a year. So the pace of tightening here, not exactly anything screaming. But if we were to get a soft CPI number, which looking at the breakdown of inflation here would reflect the realities of a situation where most inflation is imported, we can see the largest components here this yellow area, that's food. Japan imports over 60% of its food. And this green area, fuel and utilities. Japan imports the lion's share of its energy. If we were to get those things coming in and the scope for BOJ tightening were to narrow and you'd push out from where we currently are, which is making it a rate hike in about uh, a quarter's time to instead looking a little bit further afield, the yen could take something of a hit. That'll be important to watch here. And wrapping up the week's macro classics are November's flash PMI numbers from S&P Global and Company. So even when you see here, Judo Bank, Jibun Bank, HCOB, this is all done in conjunction with S&P Global. Uh, and this will be an interesting image uh, of global growth dynamics. Uh, the, the, the real standouts here, the Eurozone uh, number, where we're expected to see standstill for a second consecutive month. Uh, the UK numbers, where we're expected to see growth uh, at a familiar level, but not accelerating nor decelerating. Uh, and the US, where we're looking for a little, bit, a little bit of a pickup in services and a little bit of a slower contraction in manufacturing. As ever, uh, the way that these numbers work is above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. So on the U.S. number, for example, when you go from 48.5 to 48.8 on manufacturing, you're still shrinking just at a slower rate. Whereas when you go from 55 to 55.3 on services, you're growing at a faster rate. And really what all of these numbers boil down to looking at is – whether the U.S. continues to outpace the rest of the global economy, where you can see even in the surprise indexes here, the global total is much more anemic than the standalone U.S. index, though both show signs of improvement, the global one ostensibly being pulled by what's going on in the U.S., because the situation for global growth is not what the U.S. looks like. In fact, we can see since May, global growth has been slowing. These are catch-all global PMI numbers. The uh, blue one in the middle is the one to look at. That's the composite. We can see that despite a shallow uptick in October, the trend 
has been towards slowdown since back in May, and we're near some of the slowest levels in a year as of September. That was an eight-month low, whereas for the U.S., clearly the economy is powering ahead. If this disparity continues at the same time that the Fed is looking less dovish on rates, it'll be higher borrowing costs the world over because the Fed is an important pace setter because of the ubiquity of the U.S. dollar at a time when the global economy can ill afford it. And if the PMI numbers here give us further evidence to that extent, well, then the economic instability that is embedded there, slowing global growth coupled with higher borrowing costs, making that slowdown more acute and exacerbating it, well, then we could very well be looking at another leg lower in stocks if they choose to play that forward. And of course, speaking of stocks, there is finally NVIDIA. The thing that most jumps out here is this stock has become so vast and so huge and such an important component of the overall market that its earnings report, besides being a corporate earnings report, is also a macro sentiment indicator. And what we see in these surprises over recent quarters is that they seem to have peaked in the second quarter of 2023, where we, we saw that massive near 30% beat on EPS. From there, the quotient of surprises has slowed every quarter to 19.4, to 12.3, to 9.3, most recently for the second quarter to 5.2. As we continue to see this, it suggests the market is getting better at benchmarking this and is starting to figure out what NVIDIA looks like in terms of quarterly earnings and what the right numbers are. If we get another outcome basically on trend, an upside surprise, it's a little bit more modest, but nothing is ultimately wrong. The wheels stay on the car, the car stays on the road. It'll be a really key question whether the markets take that as good news or whether they've lost interest in showing positive response to such things because it's been benchmarked and basically priced out of surprise for asset prices. If that's the case and the market can't rally on a business as usual NVIDIA report, that would be a very significant indication of sentiment being otherwise hampered amount to a bearish signal. That'll be important to watch. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and where things are heading there from. Uh, I am likewise on Futures Power Hour Mondays and Fridays, on with Victor Jones for The Price of Truth on Wednesdays, on with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and commenting sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, as well as Blue Sky, at Ilya Spivak. If you're watching this on YouTube, like and subscribe. Macro Money's back tomorrow. Happy trading.